This is the last of a four-part series which tells the story of the 2nd Battalion of the Bedfordshire Regiment's role within Operation Michael, that being the opening phase of the 1918 German Spring Offensives. Five days of battle had left the troops on both sides exhausted and the British frontline units were at between 20 and 30% of their former strengths on average. By this stage, the British 18 and 19 Corps fighting to the south of the River Somme had been prized away from the Canal du Nord and found themselves in open countryside. With German sights on the essential railhead of Amiens, British troops garrisoned villages across the Santerre Plain and prepared to fulfil their orders to hold at all costs, while waiting for support and reinforcements to arrive. For what would be the final three days of battle for the 30th Division, the 2nd Bedfordshires and those battalions to either side of them, by now just the size of small companies at best, were under orders to hold the main road to Amiens and stop a German breakthrough onto the essential railhead. Communications between the newly arrived French units and the British units in 18 Corps were certainly not trouble free today. But much, much worse news would arrive that evening, although for the day at least, the two British Corps and a company in French divisions fought on unawares. Overnight, the 20th Division, supported by the 61st Brigade, had conducted a fighting withdrawal with German stormtroopers and scouts, until arriving in the Corps area north of Roy. En route, they had left garrisons at Pavier, Demery and Le Quesnoy, all having orders to hold their posts at all costs. As the 20th Division and 61st Brigade withdrew, the French 22nd and 62nd Divisions moved southwest overnight, taking the 36th Division and, to quote the diary, practically all of the 18 Corps artillery, both field guns and heavies, with them. As a result, for all of the 26th and the greater part of the 27th of March, 18 Corps fought with no artillery. During the chaotic French withdrawal, the 30th Division consciously disengaged itself from the French 62nd Division's orders and conformed to the British 20th Division's movements instead. The 36th Division were initially moving under French orders, but had no meaningful instructions at all, so looked to 18 Corps for them after all. The day had not started well for 18 Corps. In the 19 Corps sector to the north, the overnight withdrawal to their new lines had been completed, but the closely pursuing German forces started their assaults early morning, intending to catch the British forces before they'd settled into their new lines. The 23rd and 24th Brigades of the 8th Division both stopped German infantry attacks with heavy losses and directly to their south the 24th Division had held against a heavy attack around Fonch before 8am. But the 66th Division were driven from Herbicourt just south of the River Somme around 9am with Luncourt falling moments later. At 9.30, orders were issued to all 19 Corps divisions to conduct a slow fighting retirement to a new line between Rouvroy in the south and Foissy just south of Bray on the banks of the River Somme. The intention was to delay as much as possible and arrive in the new line just after dark. The 39th and 66th divisions came under enormous pressure, but by 2pm had shaken off their German attackers and arrived in position, albeit several hours earlier than requested. In contrast, the 8th Division's movements were almost entirely unmolested, presumably having inflicted such heavy casualties during the Germans' early morning attack. They arrived on their new line around 4pm. Back in the south, and following the confusion around the French retirement, 18 Corps hastily reorganised their positions into a defensive stance during the morning. Fortunately, the German forces in the area were seemingly also in the process of organising themselves. So the morning saw no fighting along the main line of resistance, although the villages which had been garrisoned during the overnight withdrawal came under attack as German units tried to clear a path to the main British battle line. The confusion continued as the British units, new to the area and with no knowledge of it whatsoever, followed orders but had to adapt to the local situation they found on arrival. After a few hours rest, at 8.50 in the morning, the 30th Division was initially ordered to take up a line between rouvroy en santerre and Le Quesnoy although the 90th Brigade found Le Quesnoy occupied by the 61st Brigade, so moved into a line between Bouchoir and Le Quesnoy. The flank platoon approaching Bouchoir were warned that it was already in German hands, so positioned themselves to the east of the village instead. The occupying Germans were later found to be some British engineers working in the village, so the line was extended west with, to quote the diary, a strong company, strong being a relative word by this stage numbering perhaps 50 men, astride the main road to Amiens. Outposts were placed and patrols sent out immediately. Once in place, the 89th Brigade extended the line to Rouvroy with the 20th Division to their north. Three hours later, the division was in position between Rouvroy in the north and the Amiens Road around Bouchoir in the south. While the front line was moving back and forth, the 21st Brigade were moved into Divisional Reserve at Folly, arriving by 11am. 
Like the units around them, the brigade was so badly under strength that the 2nd Yorkshires and 17th Manchesters could each split their troops into two small companies, while the 2nd Wilshires had only enough for a single very small company. Their brigade diary recorded that, The enemy were very quiet all day and a hot meal was served to the battalions and deficiencies in ammunition and rifles were made up. At 10am, Lieutenant Colonel Points, in command of the 90th Brigade since the opening day of the battle, was relieved by Brigadier Stevens as he was, to quote the diary, feeling rather seedy. Divisional GOC General Williams ordered him to get some rest, something he had not experienced for almost a week. By noon, the 2nd Bedford HQ was established at Avier with their main fighting line in front of Bouchoir. The 2nd Royal Scots Fusiliers were to their north, elements of the 20th Division appearing to their south, and a composite battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Rollo of the King's Liverpool Regiment in support around RVA. The 36th Division also moved into the open countryside to the south of the 30th Division, but found Ondeshi occupied by German troops, so contact was never established between the two flanks. In response, a detachment of Royal Engineers armed with rifles was moved into the gap. Although badly under strength, a scratch defence had been cobbled together into altogether decent defensive positions given their situation, and all before the German forces started their latest efforts to break through the lines. Around 12.25 the RAF dropped intelligence in, warning of German troops advancing in force along the Amiens Road, which heralded the start of the day's fighting for the exhausted divisions. 18 Corps immediately pulled the 20th Division from the line and into reserve around the Quesnel, along with the 61st Brigade who occupied Beaufort and Santerre. At 2pm, 89th Brigade scouts reported that Pavier and Rouvroy had been captured and the Germans were advancing on Le Quesnoy, as well as between Ondeshi and Demery, so could be expected to arrive on the 30th Division's front lines at any time. With specific orders from Corps HQ, and despite no artillery, the order was given, to quote the diary, that all roads and villages were to be defended to the last, a phrase they'd heard many times over the last week, to allow more French troops time to detrain from Montdidier. So the British troops dug in and waited for either a German attack or French relief, whichever came first. In the event, a few well-placed motor machine guns on the crossroads northwest of Le Quesnoy stopped the German advance in its tracks and inflicted heavy losses on them, so the German infantry did not reach the 30th Division's lines that day. By mid-afternoon, the combined lines of 18 and 19 Corps were extremely thin, with gaps in several places as there simply weren't enough men to create a continuous line. A squadron from the 17th Lancers were pushed into a two-mile gap between the two corps, and it was purely down to good fortune that German forces did not concentrate on that area. At 3pm, an officer patrol from the 2nd Bedfords observed Germans assembling in and around Le Quesnoy, to quote the diary, with every indication they will attack in the morning. Similar reports came in from scouts and cavalry patrols all along the corps line, although the largest concentration appeared to be in the area of the main amiens to Roy Road, 18 Corps, realising the next phase of the battle would be opening in the morning, and that the German objective was definitely the road leading directly to the critical railhead at Amiens, reorganised to provide some depth and give themselves a chance of holding the German attack. The 24th Division held the northern sector and were nominally in contact with 19 Corps, with the 30th Division in the centre and defending the Amiens road itself. The 36th Division were in the southern sector, along with some French battalions in the countryside around the division. Behind the Amiens Road defensive positions, the 21st Brigade were held in divisional reserve at Folly, with the 20th Division around Le Quesnel, Lieutenant Colonel Rollo's Composite Battalion in Arvier, and the 21st Entrenching Battalion in Hongest. More French units were expected to arrive to relieve British troops overnight, the information provided suggesting that they were detraining at Montdidier, just four miles southwest of 18 Corps' southern flank. Even though the railhead was so close and the arrival of French reinforcements seemed imminent, given recent problems with communications, 18 Corps could not assume they would arrive in time to support them. Before dusk arrived, the 30th Division were ordered to retire all forward troops to strengthen the line of resistance along the Rouvroy to Bouchoir Road, with both villages organised as strong points. The 90th Brigade held the right, with the 89th Brigade on the left. Patrols from along the Corps frontage reported a steady stream of troops and guns arriving in the area and at 6pm two officers and nine men unexpectedly arrived at the British lines, being the only survivors from the 100-strong garrison left at Le Remarkably, they had only retired when orders had arrived to do so, the Corps diary recording, This rearguard action of a small detachment during the 26th was beyond praise, and enabled the 20th Division to extricate itself from a difficult situation and continue its march from Roy to Le 
As small groups of survivors trickled into the British lines, news arrived that after several confrontational meetings between British and French generals higher up the chain of command, it had been promised that 18 Corps artillery was to be returned the next day. Two French battalions from the 133rd Division also arrived in the 18 Corps area, having just detrained at Montdidier, along with 700 American engineers, who started digging trenches covering Demuin in the 19 Corps area. News also filtered down that, to quote the diary, the 5th Army itself had by this time also come under the orders of the French. At 9pm, orders arrived to pull all patrols in and cancel any planned night patrols. The attack was imminent. The 108th Brigade of the 36th Division to the south had lost contact during the afternoon. In the early hours of the 27th, two officers from their brigade headquarters, both wounded, arrived in the 30th Division area. Urshay had been heavily shelled and around 200 Germans had pierced the divisional line and moved through their open left flank around 8pm. During the fighting, the 108th Brigade HQ had been surrounded and destroyed and the two sole survivors had managed to fight their way out. In the north... 19 Corps came under increasing pressure as the afternoon developed, the 66th, 39th and 16th Divisions being heavily engaged. Framoville was lost before a counter-attack drove the German troops back out again, and later that afternoon the 16th Division reported that their left had given way and that they were being shot at from the north bank of the Somme, south of Bray. By nightfall the Corps line stretched from Rouvroy in the south to Proyard, just south of the Somme River. Overnight, British divisions reported their patrols in constant contact with the German counterparts, but by 9pm the northern flank was reported as being secure once more. With the news that French troops were on their way to relieve 19 Corps, the men on the ground must have breathed a sigh of relief as the main battle line settled into a relatively quiet night. Unfortunately, potentially disastrous news arrived. 19 Corps diary recorded. This apparently satisfactory situation was, however, very short-lived, for at 9pm... Information was received by telephone from Army Headquarters that the 7 Corps had retired to the line Shippily Morlan Corps, and at 11.15pm, information was received that a composite cavalry force was holding the line Sally le sec mericourt Labi, which indicated a further retirement. Immediately, orders were at once issued for the destruction of all bridges as far west and including Kerisi. I had, however, no troops of any description in hand with which to guard my left flank, which was thus laid open along the big reach of the Somme, uncovered by the withdrawal of the Seven Corps, and on confirmation of this withdrawal being received, I applied to the Fifth Army for assistance. It was later learned that General Walter Congreve, an impressive commander who held the Victoria Cross, had apparently misunderstood his orders, and had been evacuating the Seven Corps across the Ancre River to the western bank. In doing so, he left 19 Corps miles in front of the British lines to their north, and the crossings along the Somme were wide open, providing German troops with full access to the undefended areas behind 19 and 18 Corps. 27th of March promised to be a difficult day for the exhausted, badly understrength units of 18 and 19 Corps. The 10-mile line running between the Somme in the north and the Havre in the south was occupied by British troops whose endurance had been sorely tested and who had suffered between 70 and 80% casualties. By rights, they should have been incapable of continuing. Yet yeah, they did. And today would push their will even further. The quiet night, as it was recorded in several diaries, was short-lived in 18 core area when, at 1am, heavy shelling started against the 30th Division lines and the villages holding the reinforcements just behind the main battle line. In response, the 2nd Yorkshires were folded into the 89th Brigade's lines, with the 2nd Wiltshires and 17th Manchesters both assigned to the 90th Brigade. During the shelling, the commanding officers of the Wiltshires and Manchesters both captains, being the most senior surviving officers, both killed. The reported 200 German cavalry who had broken through the 108th Brigade's lines the previous evening were spotted to the right of the main fighting line at 2am, around RVA and Bouchois, but patrols could not find them in the darkness, so outposts were placed to at least provide warning if they attacked an open flank during the coming battle. By daybreak, it was apparent that the situation along the line was obscure, as the Corps diary recorded, with neither British nor German forces knowing exactly where the others were. The diary records two of the instances which typifies the night's events. Overnight, scouts from the 2nd Bedfords captured a German cooking limber full of soup, two stores wagons loaded with howitzer shells, and a water cart, which were merrily travelling along the road to Amiens, completely unaware that they had crossed into what was effectively no man's land. Lieutenant Colonel Place, who had found himself in command of the 36th Division, to quote the divisional diary, started in a car early in the morning to clear up the situation on that divisional front. 
His car ran into a party of the enemy and he was himself made prisoner. The 108th Brigade diary added that, early in the morning, enemy infantry advancing from the direction of Gerbigny, which was the southernmost flank of the divisional line on the Arva River, got behind the 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers, cutting off the majority of the battalion, and a portion of the 9th Royal Irish Fusiliers, who were all taken prisoner. The 36th Division was short of commanders at division, brigade and battalion levels, and seriously low on men in the fighting lines. This state of affairs reflected the position of almost all units along that 10-mile battlefront. In 19 Corps' area, after receiving the news that 7 Corps to their north had retired and left their northern flank wide open, the 5th Army scrabbled to rush anyone available into the gap. At 1.30 in the morning, the 16th Division, on the fully exposed northern flank of 19 Corps, was sent a mixed force from 5th Army. Some 300 men armed with rifles who could at least operate as infantry, 50 men with 6 Lewis guns, and a battery of armoured cars were rushed to the area. By 3.30am most had arrived and were in place on the exposed crossings of the Somme. They did a superb job of delaying the German advance, and when the situation that evening deteriorated even further, they had certainly helped to give the beleaguered troops enough time to escape. An improvised battalion also arrived from villers bretonneux and helped stabilise the line from the Somme, north to Morlancourt. In doing so, they protected the approaches to several crossings. As expected, German artillery opened up at daybreak and the first attacks went in against 19 Corps units astride the road heading due west to Amiens. For hours, the line swayed back and forth as exhausted troops on both sides fought desperately until running out of ammunition, energy or fighting men, whichever came first. Following continuous pressure, the 16th Division, on the northern flank of 19 Corps, gave way completely and ceased to exist as a fighting formation, according to the Corps diary. Similarly attacked in force, the 39th Division were almost surrounded and formed defensive flanks until detachments from the 8th and 50th Division were rushed into counter-attack and restored their line. The 8th Division were heavily attacked around rosillon saint terre from the direction of Miharicourt. The first two waves of German infantry were entirely destroyed, yet fresh waves kept coming, eventually getting into the division's lines. A counter-attack threw the now exhausted German troops back out, which was a sequence repeated with varying degrees of determination all day on their divisional front. In the 18 Corps area, the infantry started attacking the British lines at 10am. In the opening assault, the Bedfords were able to hold their enemies at bay, but the Royal Scots Fusiliers flanks were both pierced, and after initially retiring 800 yards, they counter-attacked the German troops almost back to the RVA Folly Road. In the southern sector of the Corps front, the 36th Division was also heavily attacked between Urshay and the River Havre. The garrison in Urshay retired back to the 30th Division area around Avia and placed themselves under the orders of the 30th, as they had almost no officers left. The remainder of the division retired across the Havre, carried along by the movement of the French units around them. With only isolated groups of 36th Division troops left between the 30th Division in Avia and the remaining French units around Devenicourt, German troops soon found the open southern flank of the 30th Division and attacked immediately adding their efforts to the frontal assault. The 89th Brigade, now with both flanks exposed, came under a sustained assault as the heavy shelling continued against RVA and the German infantry kept pressing the Bedfords in Bouchoir. But the British troops in all positions continued to resist and held their ground. Once the Royal Scots Fusiliers returned to the firing line late morning and two batteries of field artillery arrived from the 5th Army to provide some desperately needed help, the 30th Division diary almost casually reported that at 12.05 the situation was well in hand. The 90th Brigade diary recorded just how precarious the situation was in reality. About noon, our line withdrew accordingly to the Folly Avia Road, brackets position Y, but the troops were dazed and weakened by their long period of fighting without any rest, and it was difficult to keep them in position under the heavy shelling. There was no sign of panic, and any attempts to withdraw were quite orderly, and the men obeyed willingly when ordered to return to their positions, but they appeared to have lost the sense of reasoning, and it was difficult to make them understand. The situation was finally restored about 3pm and the positions organised and consolidated during the evening and night. Around 12.25, the Corps and 61st Division's diaries recorded that the 36th Division had given way. The survivors had certainly retired shaken, but it took very little effort from the officer groups from the 30th Division who set out to rally and organise them. They were formed into a line running northeast from Davins Corps and the Arva River along the wooded ridge to Hongest on saint in sight of the most intense part of the battlefront, but far enough removed to be able to recover to some degree. By 12.30, the Bedfords and attached units had moved 800 yards northwest, and along with the returning Royal Scots Fusiliers, reformed the 90th Brigade fighting line along the RVA Folly Road. 
German troops pressed them all the way back, but once on their new line, the organised German assaults thrown at them were broken by intense fire from the garrisons in both villages. Any local gains made by German troops were quickly dealt with and the continuous line was in place by 1245. After the initial heavy assault on their new line, the 90th Brigade Diary reported, unsurprisingly, that Line still holding, but men are rather shaken. Several more attacks were thrown at the divisional lines, with the positions ebbing and flowing over the next two hours, until at 3pm the 90th Brigade Diary recorded, Situation finally restored. By that time, a further 10 field artillery batteries and 24 heavy guns had also arrived in the core area, adding their considerable weight to the British defence. German troops made very little effort to renew their assault that afternoon, presumably being as spent and exhausted as their British counterparts. As the afternoon wore on, troops from cut-off units of the 36th Division also trickled back to the British lines, although the 200 men from the 9th Royal Irish Rifles who made it back confirmed that the rest of the 108th Brigade had been lost. By 4pm, the 30th Division line was secure, running from the countryside north of Folly through Arvier, then onto the Arva River in the south through a string of posts manned by British and French troops along the wooded high ground to Davinscourt. Despite the incredible resilience shown by the 5th Army, who refused to break in the face of an overwhelming German attack, their commander, General Hubert Goff, arrived at his headquarters around 5.30pm to find that he was being sacked. In a grossly unfair and clearly political move orchestrated by politicians intent on covering themselves, command of the 5th Army was handed over to General Rawlinson at 4.30 a.m. the following day, but his fighting troops were, for the time being, unaware, having much more pressing matters to attend to. That evening, what remained of 18 Corps reorganised themselves with the 18th Kings north of Folly and in touch with 19 Corps units. The Royal Scots Fusiliers were in the centre and the Bedfords on the right. The 60th Brigade extended the line south from RVA where they were to make contact with what remained of the 36th Division. It was later realised that the 36th Division had ceased to exist as a fighting unit. Its divisional commander and two of its three brigade staffs were all missing, hardly any officers were left, and the remnants of the division had simply attached themselves to the nearest troops, whether British or French. The 61st Division were formed into a support line to their rear before being relieved into a promised night's rest. In a cruel twist, the division were diverted en route and ordered to counter-attack German troops out of La Motte, one mile east of Villers-Bretonneau, finally leaving the battlefield entirely on the 1st of April. The 30th Division's promised French relief did not happen either. French troops relieved the two brigades to the south in error, leaving the 89th and 90th Brigades in the front line. To add to their discomfort, none of the promised water or rations arrived, leaving the survivors to forage under a harassing artillery fire. So the day had seen German troops make progress all along both corps lines, but, although they had gained ground, no breakthrough had been made. And for those gains, German losses had been heavy. That night saw German forces attack Montdidier, and force French troops across the Don River. The railhead intended to feed reinforcements into the area was closed. 19 Corps to the north had also been involved in the same gruelling back-and-forth fighting all afternoon, with all of their available reserves being fully committed to stop a breakthrough. However hard the troops fought, they could do nothing about the German forces crossing the Somme and cutting off their line of retreat though, with some of the now tiny divisions being forced to fight facing east and west simultaneously. Although a variety of temporary commands had been created, comprised of every non-combatant capable of wielding arms, such as Carey's force, who collectively formed a rearguard line behind the isolated 19 Corps, there were just no more troops available to counter-attack the encircling German movements. Darkness arrived, but with it no orders to retire. All divisions were warning their corps commander that they were outflanked and at least partially surrounded, with little or no intelligence available to suggest what German forces were where. The 19 Corps War Diary records the very British version of the back and forth which followed between them and the generals all the way up the chain of command. The enemy was thus astride my main route of communication to the front line, and representations were made to the 5th Army regarding the dangerous situation which had thus arisen, and which would be accentuated should the enemy reinforce this force during darkness, as he probably would do. I was, however, instructed to maintain the line I was on in spite of this, and although I considered that the safety of my force was endangered, I had no option but to issue orders accordingly. As a result of the most urgent representations from my divisional commanders during the night, and in consequence of reports that the enemy were in Bayonville and the neighbourhood, I again represented the matter to the 5th Army, and at 4.30am on the 28th received sanction to withdraw my troops from the front line. Regardless of how disgracefully he had just been treated, General Goff continued arguing for his men to the bitter end, despite knowing he was about to be relieved of his command and sent home in disgrace. He had been left dangerously late, but
But if nothing else, the troops of 19 Corps had a glimmer of hope. During the early hours of the 28th of March, 19 Corps' divisions withdrew in small groups through the German lines and outposts, forming a new defensive line running from Marcel Cove in the north to the northern flank of 18 Corps' lines around Wauvier. To the north of 19 Corps was Carey's force, mainly comprised of engineers, and other assorted units extending the British lines northwards to the Somme River at saint le sec although the 19 Corps diary recorded its opinion of Carey's force as... The strength of this force was about 2,400, and it was composed of a most heterogeneous collection of units, of which some were of very little fighting value. That said, although they were not trained riflemen, so their offensive capabilities were understandably very limited, they were positioned among the battle-worn but experienced British divisions and some scattered French battalions, so were capable of wielding firearms and putting up a defence against the exhausted German infantry arrayed against them. It was just enough to stem the German advance in their area of the battlefield until the fresh divisions being rushed in from other areas of the Western Front and Italy arrived. To the south, 18 Corps had been all but broken up during the overnight reorganisation and ultimately ceased to exist as a fighting formation for the time being. The 20th and 61st Divisions were already under the command of 19 Corps and moving to their fighting line further north. The 36th Division was miles off to the west, defending French artillery around Coulomel, and just the battered units of the 30th Division, with the remnants of the 21st Brigade battalions folded into the 89th and 90th Brigade lines, remained in the fighting line under command of the French Group of Mesbleu. Their fragile line ran from east of Arvier through Folly and extended northeast to Warvier, with the French 56th Division continuing their line southwest to the Arva River and the French 133rd Division under orders to relieve the remaining British troops of the 30th Division, although in reality they had formed their line further back and would not approach the British lines until later that day. So it was that as dawn broke on what would be their last day of Operation Michael, the Bedfords and the other utterly exhausted troops of the 30th Division were being forced to stay awake by those around them, even drifting off to sleep when under heavy bombardment. Early that morning, Lieutenant Colonel Points rejoined the 2nd Bedfords of their commanding officer, having been in command of the 90th Brigade throughout the entire battle. He had been relieved from command of the 90th Brigade and ordered to an enforced, if brief, bed rest, after reaching a point of utter exhaustion. The overnight French relief had started, although the Royal Scots Fusilier recorded that, by 6am only 30 French had arrived in the position, which they apparently considered to be an outpost line, but it was decided to hang on. The French relief of 18 Corps had apparently started, but was very piecemeal. At 8.30 a German bombardment against the 30th Division's lines opened the new day of battle, and increased in intensity until the infantry assault started 90 minutes later. By 11 in the morning the divisional front was being, to quote the diary, heavily pressed and with German field guns firing over open sights from just 800 yards away, their casualties quickly mounted. Yet the troops held, and the brigade diary recorded how the line was holding everywhere. Curiously, a French officer arrived in the embattled lines at 11 in the morning. The 19th Brigade diary recording that he intimated that we had been relieved as French troops were in position behind us, but in the absence of a definite order, the brigade remained in position. With the heavy fighting going on without pause, the Royal Scots Fusiliers were visited by an officer from the 89th Brigade who told them, to quote the diary, that they were considering themselves relieved and withdrew immediately, although no French defence was apparent. The Fusiliers were left with an open left flank so formed their own defensive flank and put down a curtain of strong rifle fire, which they kept up without pause until they withdrew later that afternoon. The 89th Brigade diary for its part simply records that our line in front of Folly held firm and was handed over to the French at their request. At noon, a heavy infantry assault went in against Arvier, a few hundred yards from the southern flank of the Bedfords. The 90th Brigade diary recorded that troops on our right seen retiring. With the Bedfords' right flank also now wide open, they too formed their own defensive flank and laid down their own strong curtain of rifle fire, which held the German troops back. The 89th Brigade diary recorded that around the same time, troops to the right, which is presumably the French battalions, given that the 36th Division had already been relieved, probably in front of Angest and Plessier, seen withdrawing, Kay and Angest occupied by the enemy. As the early afternoon wore on, the German assaults against the 90th Brigade lines lost their intensity, and several half-hearted attempts were relatively easily beaten back. The brigade were now completely isolated, and not for the first time in increasing danger of being surrounded, but they held on. Around 2pm the decision was made by Corps and filtered down to the division's position soon afterwards, with the Royal Scots Fusiliers diary recording that... It was decided about 2pm to withdraw as the position was becoming untenable. SAR ammunition was practically exhausted. Word was now received that we were relieved and were to withdraw, but to minimise casualties, it was decided to hang on till dusk. 
Immediately afterwards it was found that the Bedfords and RSF were alone in the trenches with the enemy far round on the right, so the orders to withdraw were given. During this we suffered numerous casualties from MG and field gun fire. The Bedfords to their south had similar problems, with many German machine guns dominating their open southern flank, supported by the nearby field guns which had not been silenced. So, breaking into open formation, the remaining troops retired behind the French screen some way back, reformed six miles along the Amiens Road at Mézier en Santerre, headed west and crossed the Havre River at Muriel, before marching to Billitz in Rouvrel. Lieutenant Colonel Points' personal diary recorded the moment. It was a wonderful sight to see the remains of all of our different units, and also the units of almost every division plodding slowly through Muriel. It was simply packed with retiring troops, all absolutely worn out. The poor inhabitants were still in the town, busy getting their portable belongings out of the houses they were forced to desert once more. The roads towards Amiens were packed with these poor dejected French people, and it made us feel so sorry for them, but we could do little to help them at this stage. To add to their troubles, rain began falling steadily. On arrival at Rouvrel, we got the men under cover in billets and tried to make them comfortable. Most of them just lay down and slept, as they had had practically none for eight days. Lieutenant Colonel Points would be sent to Rouen the next day, as he was still extremely ill, going back to a British hospital soon afterwards. That evening, the commanders took stock. The most pressing issue was that their brigades were, as the diary records, average 500 strong. So they held a conference and organised each brigade into a single composite battalion in expectation of having to return to the fighting. Although standing ready to move at one hour's notice and receiving several orders, followed by cancellations, the survivors in the 21st, 89th and 90th Composite Battalions of the 30th Division's involvement in Operation Michael had come to a close. Early on the 30th of March, orders arrived which saw the division move to Salur. Heavy traffic and persistent rain made the 12-mile journey drag on all day, their arrival at Salur being greeted with hot meals. From 4.30pm, the 21st and 89th Composite Battalions boarded trains bound for saint valery sur somme on the coast, and from there they entrained to the Ypres sector. The 90th Composite Battalion, which included the Bedfords, arrived early the next morning and rested all day until their transport arrived to take them to Ypres. In the fighting line, however, 19 Corps was still heavily engaged. The days that followed saw more French divisions arrive, a fresh Australian brigade, the 2,000 survivors from the 18th Division, and other much smaller divisions moved in from 18 Corps. Localised attacks continued, with the line being edged back daily but not breaking. Between the 2nd and 5th of April, the last of the German attacks went in, but they were unable to break into Amiens, and the 16 days of Operation Michael finally came to a close. Operation Michael saw the Allied lines push back an incredible 40 miles in some places, enormous gains in the context of the Great War, although the critical railheads at Arras and Amiens remained in Allied possession. 1,200 square miles of ground was captured by German forces, but in reality it was of little value to them. The heavy fighting of 1916 and 1917 had left it as not much more than a wilderness of shell holes, and it was very hard to defend. Having destroyed the infrastructure and poisoned the wells during their own 1917 retreat, German forces would find that backfiring on them, as all of their supplies had to be moved through an increasingly long and painfully slow supply line. The initial German jubilation soon turned sour when it became clear they were in possession of an area which would drain their already limited resources, and the human cost was incredibly high. Both the German and British French forces lost a staggering quarter of a million troops each. So combined, that is half a million casualties in just 16 days. Allied losses would be replenished over the summer with the arrival of the American Doughboys, but the German losses were harder to recover from, with many of their elite troops lost in the fighting. 18 Corps accounted for almost 22,000 of the nearly 180,000 British losses, with the Corps diary recording the 36th Division, 6,109, the 61st Division, 5,514, the 30th Division, 5,051, and the 20th Division, 5,004. Edmund's official history recorded that six divisions lost more than 5,000 men, or four of the 18 Corps divisions, along with the 16th and 66th Division from 19 Corps. Within the 30th Division, the War Diary records, the 90th Brigade lost over 1,600 men, leaving 500. 16th Manchester lost 623, almost all of those on the opening day. 2nd Bedford's lost 570, 2nd Royal Scots Fusiliers 384, and the headquarters and trench mortar batteries are combined 31 men. The 89th Brigade lost nearly 1,200 men, leaving them with 1,000, with the 17th Kings 323, 18th Kings 371, 19th Kings 478, and the 21st Brigade lost almost 1,600 men as well, leaving them with 450. The 2nd Wiltshire's lost 635 men, also almost all during the opening day. 
the 17th Manchester is 471, and the 2nd Yorkshire is 433. Following their huge losses and astounding resilience, the spent divisions were moved north to a quieter part of the line from which to rebuild, retrain and rest. But in a terrible twist of fate, those same troops would find themselves moving into the line which was about to become the focus of the Battle of the Lys, a new front within the overall German spring offensives. But that is another story entirely.